Now my question is, when was the last time that you laid aside your fishing nets, laid aside your busy job as a fisherman, and you just came and dined with Jesus? When was the last time you did that? I want to share with you something the Lord laid on my heart. A couple years ago, I was in the prayer closet spending time with the Lord, and I was reading in John chapter 21 this incredible story. I hope your Bible's open there, John 21. And how the Lord Jesus was standing on the shore of the Sea of Galilee and invited the disciples to dine with him. And as I was reading this, it was like the, the Holy Spirit was saying, there's another application to this, my son. We can enjoy special fellowship with Jesus. So, I'd like to speak on the subject, how to dine at Jesus' table. Our Lord himself, here in verse number 12, in, invites us, come and dine. Come and dine, the Master calleth. Come and dine. We've got this amazing story how after the resurrection, the disciples, well, Peter said, where is it in verse 3 there, I go a-fishing. And the other disciple says, well, we'll go with you. And so off in the boat they went. And they toiled all night and they didn't catch anything. And then in the morning, Jesus standing there. This is the resurrected Christ. And he calls to them. says, have you caught anything? And they says, no, we haven't. Well, cast your net on the other side. And Jesus did this once before with Peter. And so they did. And they took in this great multitude of fishes. I, I did some calculating and I don't know if this is correct or not, but it's only my calculation. But it says they weren't just fish, they were great fishes. And so I figure a great fish has got to be 22 inches long. So if you figured, and this is only my rough calculating, if you figured six pounds each, um, quite likely there was uh, over 900 pounds worth of fish that they caught. That would have been worth a lot of money. But that's not the point. The point is the Lord Jesus still does miracles in people's lives. And we're no different. We need miracles of God in our lives. And if we will look to Jesus, we can have something special. And the topic today is banqueting with Jesus. Imagine that, a banquet with Jesus. That's what they had on the shore of Galilee, a banquet with Jesus. This idea of banqueting is mentioned some 70 times in the Bible. So there's quite a, quite a list of banquets in the Bible. I'll give you four of them. Psalm 23, verse 5. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 4. He brought me to the banqueting house, and his banner over me was love. Luke 14, 16. Then said he unto them, A certain man made a great supper and bade many. And Revelation 3, 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him. There's the banquet there, and he with me. All this eating, it might help explain why Bible-believing Christians always seem to like to have a little food alongside of their fellowship. Just a thought. I'd like to talk with you about a spiritual banquet table. I'm going to give you a parable today where we compare earthly and heavenly things together. But the Lord really does have something special for us as we enter into a close fellowship with Jesus Christ. We call it the banqueting table. Not talking about the communion table. Please understand that. Not talking about the communion table at all. This is different. This is a one-on-one -on -one relationship, you and Jesus. It's sort of like a banquet. Well, what sort of things are at this table and what sort of enjoyment is there for you and for me? That's what we're going to look at. First, let's begin with prayer. Our loving Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us here today. And I pray that you would please grant to us the power to, to see, to 
to learn, to believe, to grasp, to benefit. Father, I pray for anyone today who may have a troubled heart, some burden, some, some pressing trouble. Please give them a little vacation from that. Help each and every one of us gathered here and watching online. Help each and every one of us to, to get and have what it is you, you, you want us to have. Bless this time. Make it profitable. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, once again, I want to remind you that what I want to share with you is kind of, well, I, I call it a parable. I think you'll get the drift of it. I, I think it's very obvious what I'm going to talk about. But uh, what I want to do is um, talk about dining with the Lord. And again, we're not talking about communion. Now, what is the overall purpose of a, um, a banquet with the Lord? What is the overall purpose? The overall purpose is meant to spend time with the Lord. That's what it's for. You go to any banquet and there's going to be some interaction there. You're going there for a purpose. Not just for the food, but there's some sort of program perhaps. Some sort of interaction with the host of the, of the meal. Now, the Lord is telling us, come and dine. He's inviting us to come near to Him. Now, we're talking a banquet table. And a banquet table, as you know, is usually something that's been very carefully thought through and prepared. Perhaps some of the food on the table is rare and maybe expensive. Maybe it, it took the host a long time to be able to gather all of the food items together. And so, usually, it's, it's quite something. The table itself, the banquet table itself, has to be large and strong to hold up all of the, the weight of the food. And often there's a beautiful tablecloth on it. And so, let's now take a look at the spiritual banqueting table that the Lord invites us to. Number one, if you're a note taker, point number one is the table itself. Now, we're talking a parable today. So what is this spiritual table we're talking about? I want to suggest to you in my parable, the table is the love of God, which is the strong foundation of all His blessings. John chapter 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, God is love. 1 John 4, 10, Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us. And sent his son to be a, the propitiation. That means a satisfaction, a payment that satisfies. He sent Jesus to be the propitiation for our sins. And make no mistake, each and every one of us, we have a problem. It's called sin. Bad thoughts, bad words, things we ought to do that we don't. Broken promises. Ooh, that's just the scratching of the surface of sin. But it's all the same. It's all sin. God's dealings with us, with you and with me, are based upon His eternal love for us. That's a very important principle to understand. And that's why we have a strong table. And that's the only explanation as to why an Almighty God would stoop down to a sin-filled world. A world filled with sinful people. You calling me a sinner? Yeah, I'm calling us sinners. We are all sinners. How do you know that? God's Word tells us, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, unless you're going to sit there and tell me that you're absolutely perfect and you've never had a bad thought, never said a bad word, never done an unkind thing, never broken a promise, on and on, you know, the list goes. If you're going to sit there and tell me you've never ever in your life, ever once, done something you shouldn't, well, either you are the one person in the whole world or you're lying <laughs> because all of us have a sin problem. We're born with it. Yeah. It's a shame, but it is what it is. The only reason why God, an almighty, holy, pure God, would have anything to do with us is because of His love. For God so loved the world. But as we look at this table, this table that represents His strong love, Something I want you to notice, and that is the table is shaped like a cross. It's the cross of Jesus. 
The cross upon which Jesus died. This is the table. It's as if the table were like an altar, if you will, upon which Jesus was sacrificed for you and for me. This is what met the demands of Almighty God and His justice. If God could have saved our souls, forgiven our sins, by having Jesus come and live a few years and do a few miracles and say a few nice words, He would have done it. But it required more than that. If getting to heaven for you and I was just a matter of uh, being good citizens, paying your taxes, you know, being nice to the dog, if that's what would get us to heaven, then there was no need for Jesus to leave heaven and come and die and shed His blood on the cross. The truth is, there is one way and only one. There's not two ways to get to heaven. There's one way and that's through Jesus. He said, I am the door. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That means that all the other world religions will not get you to heaven. That means that all of the good works in the world will not get you to heaven. That means the the communion table will not get you to heaven. The baptismal font will not get you to heaven. Saying prayers or counting beads or giving money or anything else you can possibly think of will not get you to heaven. They may be good things in their own right, but they're not going to get you to heaven. Only Jesus can get you to heaven. Jesus died for you and for me upon Calvary's cross. And that cross is now turned on the horizontal. And it's like the strong foundation of God's love where he sacrificed his son for you and for me. And Jesus shed his blood. Make no doubt about that. Abraham was called upon to offer his son Isaac. Maybe you remember that, reading it in the Bible. But at the last moment, God stopped Abraham and says, No, I just wanted to see you were willing. God provided a ram, it's a male sheep caught in the thicket there in place of Isaac. But when it came to God's own son, God did not stop. He gave his own son. He went all the way and Jesus actually died. He shed his blood for you and for me. And it's only through the shed blood of Christ that we have any hope of getting to heaven. Even though um, Aunt Matilda's gone, all the prayers in the world aren't going to get her to heaven. Even though Uncle Zeke is now passed away and in the grave, all of the holy water, all of the prayers, all of the candles, all of the giving of money, none of it's going to get Uncle Zeke to heaven. The only thing that could get Anyone, Aunt Matilda, Uncle Zeke, you and me, the only way any of us can get to heaven is by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. That was the one and only way. And by the way, we only have this life in which to do it. You wait too long, this life's over, you're out of luck. It's like the offer has expired. This offer of eternal life is for those of us that are alive and breathing We have the opportunity. That's why the Bible says today is the day of salvation. So, I'd like you to take your Bible, please, and turn to the right, to the book of Romans. So, after John, you've got Acts, and then Romans, chapter number 5, and verse 8. I want you to see this with your own eyes. God's Word, the Bible, tells us this important truth. Chapter 5 of Romans, and verse number 8. And when you have that, keep your seats, but read it out loud together with me, please. Romans 5, 8, let's read. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Yeah, Jesus died for us while we were yet sinful, alienated from God. Jesus died for us. You know, most of us here would probably if we had to, sacrifice our life for our best loved one in the world. Maybe for you, it's your mom or your dad or your husband, your wife, your son, your daughter, but someone so dear to your heart that if need be, you'd step up and say, okay, I'll die for them so that they can live. But not many of us here would, would die for a stranger. I don't even know that man. I don't even know that woman. Why should I give my life for them? But... I don't think any of us here would die for an enemy, someone who's purposely set out to hurt us and do things that have caused us pain and grief. 
Why should I die for them? And yet, while we were in that condition, enemies with God, Christ died for us. God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Isn't that love? That's love that only God has. And he did that for you and for me. And so as we approach the Lord's banqueting table, we realize that it's by no merit of my own that I get to come to the table. Oh Lord, I, I, I'm, I'm worthy to come to your table because I'm a nice guy. Oh yes, I shave every morning and I part my hair just right. I make sure that I shine my shoes. I walk out the door. I say hello to the neighbors. I get to work on time. I shake my boss's hand. I'm kind to all my fellow employees. I don't complain. I get my paycheck at the end of the week. I go home. I carefully pay all of my bills and so on. I've done this all my life. Surely there's a place for me. No. No. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We are so imperfect. And to just go on deceiving ourselves, thinking, well, if anyone's going to get to heaven, I guess it should be me. After all, I'm just as good as the next guy. What a self-deception. Jesus preached more about hell than he ever did heaven. And he said, except ye be born again, ye cannot see the kingdom of God. Very, very clear was Jesus. There is no merit of our own that we have access to this wonderful table. It's only God's great love that would allow us to be there. Now, an example of God's great love is actually seen in the Old Testament life of King David. At one point uh, in his kingdom, he decided, I would like to show special love if there's any relative still living of the, the lineage of Saul. Saul was king before David and he died and all his relatives died. Saul had a son named Jonathan and David and Jonathan were the best of friends but Jonathan died. And King Saul said to his most able men, he says, are there any living descendants of Saul? And they came back to him and they said, yes, there is one. His name is Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth was a cripple. He was dropped as a baby and he was lame in the feet for the rest of his life. He was a cripple. King David said, send for him, bring him here. Long story short, they brought Mephibosheth and King David said these words. He said, uh, fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake and will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father, and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. You see? That's the banqueting table. The Lord God shows us love. Even though we're crippled, we're marred with sin, even though we're sinners, God says, I'll still take you. The offer is still open. So you see, Jesus invites us to his banqueting table. Listen, if you're here today and you've never come to Jesus for salvation, the invitation is open. The Lord says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Ah, oh, it's a wonderful thing to know the Lord is your Savior. Now the table, this table, this spiritual table in the shape of a cross, we notice is covered with a Gorgeous, pure white cloth. What is that? That is God's own righteousness and holiness and purity. But the Lord does not expect his guests to stand at his table. And so point number two, we have a seat. We have a seat at the table. What is this seat in our parable? Well, it's the grace and mercy of God is what it is. And what a thrill and what an honor it is to have a seat next to the king at the table. Jesus himself. Listen to this. A seat with your name on it. Have you ever been to a banquet and there was little cards with people's names and there was a card with your name on it? Has that ever happened to you? It's kind of a thrill, isn't it? Hey, they took the time and they made a place for me. No one else can sit there. There's a place with my name on it. Psalm 86.5 for thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive and plenteous in mercy 
unto all them that call upon thee. Ephesians 2, 8, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Hebrews 4, 16, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I'll tell you this, God is a loving God. He's a gracious and merciful God. Once again, we are made to realize that any closeness to God and blessing from God is not because of how great we are. Take your Bible and turn to the right from Romans to the book of Titus. So you're going to get past 1st 2 Corinthians. Then you're going to pass the Thessalonians and Timothy, 1st and 2nd Timothy, and then you'll find Titus. Chapter number 3. Titus chapter 3. Titus 3 and verse number 5. Verse 5. Read it out loud together with me now. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Those last words, the washing of regeneration, are thought to be the Bible. How the Bible has a washing effect on us. And the regenerating of the Holy Ghost is what the Holy Spirit does for us. That's how we get born again into God's family. But you'll notice it's not by works of righteousness. No merit of my own. You see? Therefore, when you and I approach near to our King Jesus Christ, we must do so with the same mental attitude as Mephibosheth. He was a cripple and he knew it. We must approach God the same way. I don't have anything to offer you, God. My greatest assets, my greatest abilities, my health, all my wealth, these things are nothing. They mean nothing. I have nothing to offer you, Lord, except my sinful self. And that's what God is looking for. Because he's not come to call the righteous. He's come to call sinners to repentance. Righteous people, you know, they, think, they don't think they need to repent. Righteous people think they're going to heaven because, you know, hey, I've done this, that, and the other thing. And if God doesn't like it, well, he can lump it. That's the attitude of self-righteous people. But someone who has some humility and has the smarts to understand that God is so powerful and so holy and we are not. We come to Him in humility. So this means we need to repent of any self-righteous thoughts or worldly thoughts. We need to be willing to lay aside our garments stained with sin. And our loving Lord Jesus will clothe us in robes of righteousness made from the very cloth that adorns His table. Now, we've come to the table. We've come to the table. But what is the first thing we see upon the table? And this is point number three. It's the candelabra. The candelabra is like a candlestick. And it'll have a base, and usually it'll have a few branches with candles in them. They're ornate, and they kind of look nice. What is the candelabra here in our parable? It is what you're holding. The Word of God It's the Bible. That is the candelabra. It gives light to everything on the table. Without this light, we wouldn't see anything on the table. We wouldn't even see the table itself if it weren't for the light. And you know yourself when you are in a darkened room, maybe at 2.30 in the morning when you wake up and you've got to run to the little boys room there it's dark in the house how often have you been walking and oh stubbed your toe because it was dark you didn't see the way and you stumbled well we have the bible so that we can see what's in front of us psalm 119 105 thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path No wonder there's so much spiritual blindness in the world. People aren't reading the Bible. A generation ago, more people read the Bible. A generation before that, a lot more people read the Bible. And three generations ago, almost everybody read the Bible. But the Bible Bible decline over the years. Are you a Bible reader? Do you read your Bible? 
Psalm 43, verse 3, O send out thy light and thy truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me unto thy holy hill and to thy tabernacles. The light of God's word is sweet to our eyes. Just like when you're in a dark room and you get some light. A little bit of light. Oh, that is sweet. You know in hell there's no light. Did you know that? Did you know that hell is a dark place? There's no light at all in hell. Some people say, well, I I don't care about heaven. I'm going to go to hell and, and have a good old time with my buddies. You fool, you won't even see your buddies. You'll hear them cry and scream in the darkness, in the distance, but you'll never see them. Hell is a very lonely place. It's a very dark place. Heaven, on the other hand, is a very happy place and it's full of light. God gave us a book full of light. It's the candelabra. If you're not reading the Bible every day, my friend, you're in darkness. There's no other way to put it. You and I are in darkness if we're not reading the Bible every day. The soft glow of the Bible illuminates the path before us so we do not stumble. The Word of God helps us to see the difference between right and wrong, between truth and error. We can know what's right by reading the Bible. The Bible also helps us to see ourselves. It's almost like looking into a mirror. You can sort of see yourself by reading the Bible. The Bible is an amazing book. It's a living book. And the Bible will speak to your heart. And maybe that's one reason why so many people don't want to read the Bible. Because they tried it once and... oh. They didn't like what the Bible had to say to them, maybe. Oh, I'm never reading that book again. And they start calling it foolish and lies and things like that. But, listen, the Bible must be present every time we want to meet with the Lord at His table. We must take some time and allow the Bible to shine itself on us and search our hearts. The choir sang an amazing song for us. God's Word changes lives. You show me someone who's reading the Bible and I'll show you someone who has an exciting new life. You know, that's what happened in my life. Back in 1974, I had so much darkness, questions, problems. And then my aunt came to visit and I shared with her, I said, boy, I don't know what's happening in my life. She said, you need to read the Bible. So I looked around the house and the only Bible we had was a King James Bible. Does God still use that old King James Bible? He did in this old life. And by 1975, I understood the way to salvation. April the 6th, 1975 is my spiritual birthday. It's going to be 48 years in just a matter of weeks. Can't believe how quick the years go by. Isn't that what we all say? How does it happen? And especially when we see the little children, we turn around, now they're up to here. (gasps) What happened? Well, the years go by. Well, we must let the Bible illuminate our minds and teach us more about our Savior and His love. So in other words, read and meditate the Bible if you want to get in close with Jesus. But we're at the table. We've seen the candelabra. Now what? The candelabra is shining light on what's in front of us. And what's in front of us is point number four. It's the plate. The plate. What is the plate in our parable? The plate is that which holds the menu. The food. The menu is a large portion of worship and praise to Almighty God. That's what goes on the plate. John chapter 4, verse 23, 24, Jesus said, But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Psalm 95, verse 6, O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. Revelation 4, 8. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. You know something? 
The worship of Almighty God is absolutely essential as a part of healthy spiritual diet. It is absolutely essential. Giving worship and praise to God is only proper and right, seeing that He is our Creator and our Savior. Giving worship and praise to God drives the devil out of the room. If you're having problems with evil thoughts, start worshiping God and praising Him, and you'll find very quickly the devil says, well, if you're going to do that, I'm out of here. Now you have a peaceful mind and a peaceful heart. Giving worship and praise to God opens your soul and spirit to many more blessings that God wants to give you. Worship and praise, listen to this, Worship and praise are an all-you-can-eat main dish. It's impossible to overindulge. It's not like you're only allowed to have a little bit. You cannot eat too much of them. They will not harm your health in any way, but they will only make you healthier. They will bring a rich glow to your face and skin and make you feel like you're walking on a cloud. Come and dine. Worship and praise. And here's a dining tip. I call it a dining tip. If you want to make it even a a better experience, bring some music with you. When you get alone with God and you get to the, the worship and the praise, after you've had your Bible time and you're worshiping and praising Him, why don't you get some music going You say, well, I I don't have a record player, a cassette player. I don't have a CD or something going. But you've got your voice. You are learning, when you come to church, you are learning hymns and songs and spiritual songs. We sing choruses and things. And you can bring these with you into your prayer closet. When you come to dine with Jesus. And you can start to worship Him with songs. And even if you say, well, I, I just can't do it. I can't do it. I can't bring myself to sing to, to the Lord, even in private. If you're that way, all right, then find some recorded music. Bring it in with you. There's always a way. If you want to enrich your dining experience with Jesus, get some music going there. It will bless you and the Lord. Now, when we have cleaned our plate, so to speak, point number five, the cup. The cup. What is the cup in our parable? The cup is our prayers to God. The very fruit of our lips. Acts 2.42 says the early Christians continued steadfastly in prayers. You see? They got those prayers in there. 1 Peter 3.12 says, For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and His ears are open unto their prayers. Revelation 5.8 talks about golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. God wants you to raise the cup of prayer to your lips and start praying. And from our lips ought to come forth in prayer words of love and honor and obedience. But it's also the time that we can tell Jesus about the burdens on our heart. If you have a problem at work, start telling him. If there's someone in your life that's causing you grief and trouble, start telling the Lord all about it and praying for that person. Now is the time. We can tell him our prayer requests. And make no mistake, Jesus wants to hear our prayers because he wants to answer our prayers. He says so. John 16, 24. Hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name. Ask and ye shall receive that your joy may be full. Matthew 7, 7. Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. Now all of what I've told you so far. This is a good way of coming to dine with Jesus. Come and dine, says Jesus. And this is how you do it. This is a great way to do it. First, you come in humility and repentance. Second, you read the Bible and let it illuminate your heart and soul. Third, you spend a generous amount of time in worshiping and praising God for His goodness. Include some worshipful hymns and music. And number four, is you tell Him the burdens on your heart and you ask Him your prayer requests. 
But there still remains one last dish on the table with Jesus. Now I would normally say, what do you think it is? But we don't have time. So I'll tell you. Point number six. The dessert. Now that may seem a little odd here at the banquet table with the Lord. The dessert. But what is the dessert in the parable? The dessert is that which finishes the meal. The dessert is something sweet. The dessert is thankfulness to God. That's the last item on the table. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Listen, always, always, always finish your dining experience with thanksgiving. It is so important that we do that. Colossians chapter 3.15 And let the peace of God rule in your hearts to the which also ye are called in one body and be ye thankful. And 1 Corinthians 15.57 But thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Be ye thankful. Never leave the banqueting table without giving sincere thanks to God in prayer. Now for several years now, we've made it a practice here in our church to finish off Sundays, Sunday night church, by getting on our knees for one minute. We call it the one minute thank you prayer meeting. And we get on our knees and each of us gives thanks to God privately for the great things God has done. And it's only proper. It's only respectful. So listen, in conclusion, Jesus called his disciples, come and dine. That's what we read in John chapter 21. Come and dine. Do you consider yourself a disciple of Jesus? Do you consider yourself a follower of Jesus and a learner of Jesus? That's what a disciple is. Someone who follows Jesus and learns from Jesus. Do you consider yourself a disciple of Jesus? Because if you do, our Lord has an invitation Come and dine. That's a very sweet invitation. Now my question is, when was the last time that you laid aside your fishing nets, laid aside your busy job as a fisherman, and you just came and dined with Jesus? When was the last time you did that? Did you approach his table and his chair with humility? Did you first allow the Bible, the Word of God, to bathe you in its marvelous light? And how about a, a serving of worship and praise? Did you take a big serving of worship and praise to God? Or did you just burst into the banquet hall and grab up the cup of prayer as fast as you could? Is that how you did it? And did you remember the dessert dish? The thankfulness. Now even though this sermon was a bit of a parable, I think that the meaning is clear enough. And I'd like to invite you today to do something about it. I'd like you to put feet to your faith. I'd like you to put the, uh, as they say, the, the rubber to the pavement. I'd like to ask you, I'd like to invite you to come to the Lord's altar today. We call this front area the altar. I'd like to invite you to the altar today and spend a moment in prayer with the Lord. Now you don't have to come, you don't have to do anything you want. You don't want to do, you don't have to do it. But I want to encourage you. Come and spend a moment or two with God in prayer. Get on your knees and ask Jesus if he would give you an invitation to come and dine with him. It's far too long the devil's got the upper hand in our lives. It's far too long he's just got us busy out there with our nets on the Sea of Galilee, fishing, oh no fish, more fishing, no fish, more fishing. Just got to keep doing this, keep doing it, keep doing it. Just leave it. Come to the shore. Get alone with Jesus. Tomorrow morning is a brand new day. Maybe you'll set aside 15 minutes or 20 minutes for a prayer closet. And come and dine with the Master. I'd like to encourage you to do that. Come today. Let the Lord meet with you. Let's all stand to our feet, shall we? Thank you for watching the message today. 
We invite you to join us again every Sunday and Wednesday for more inspiring messages from God's Word. Thank you.